Good morning. I hope this microphone works. Is it? Yeah. Just uh, picked it up a moment ago. So let me just readjust myself. Uh, my name's Ken Webster. My background is in environmental education. But these days, I spend most of my time talking about economics. And uh, additionally, I work for a foundation set up by a round-the-world sailor, Ellen McCarthy. You may or may not have heard of her. But she has changed direction, too. She's not sailing anymore so much as looking at trying to uh, help young people redesign, rethink the future in novel ways. So I'm going to go into a little bit of education, a little bit of the economy, a lot about feedback, and I hope it won't be from my microphone. And uh, I've got just under 18 minutes. OK, let me start with the economy. There it is. It's the linear economy. It's pretty good because it's take, make, and dispose. You know that. You're that sort of audience. We take resources, we make stuff, and we produce things, and almost all of it is waste. About 70% of that waste happens between getting the resources and making something. Nearly 30% is before the consumer gets hold of it. That's almost everything. And then, of course, what we talk of most when we're cleaning up the Baltic or whatever is waste, which is post-consumer. But much of it happens in the system, and a lot of it is energetic waste, waste from producing energy. Now, the problem with this is, of course, as people have pointed out, it's a one-way system. And you can't run it forever. And there are coming up, we're coming up now to a couple of really hot spots when it comes to not running this system anymore. There's the world's liquid supplies. You only have to look at one part of that, and that's the bit with the arrows which says unidentified project. It hasn't got a color. It's between a line that says something about the demand, which is the top line, and the colored lines. Now, that's 43 bill a million barrels of oil a day, which we don't have an idea where we're going to get. We don't have an idea where we're going to get this from. And these are figures from the Environmental uh, Inf Information Administration in the US. You know, they're pretty conservative. So 43 million barrels of oil a day is about four Saudi Arabias. Hmm, tricky. So how are we going to run the economy, which is at the white line, when we've got a rather large upcoming gap? It's not going to be the same economy. To add to that, here the white line is of what's most interest. Here's a, a line about 33 commodities over a period of time, over 100 years. And despite the bumps up and down, we've been getting cheaper commodities for a long time. Until quite recently, this is a report from an investment banking consultancy. They say that the trend is now going to be upwards, it is upwards, and firmly upwards. We've all heard probably about China and the, the availability of rare earth metals in Europe. Quite uh, worrying, because China control almost all of the production of that me those metal groups. We've heard about the rising prices of copper, and in Britain, I don't know about here, people are seem, to be, are seem to be quite keen on stealing the railways. Well, if you know what I mean, at least the cabling that goes with it. And an audacious couple of people stole the earth wire from the pylons in one part of Britain, which was potentially going to be an error if it went wrong that would kill them. But that means that, to me, that copper is worth salvaging. So we've got commodities no longer getting cheaper, oil getting more expensive and much less available, much readily available. It's, still, it's never going to run out. You'll always squeeze something out of somewhere. But What's that mean? Now, if you're talking to business, and we talk a lot to business, if you're a shareholder, if you own a company, and your company is either about moving stuff through, maybe you're a big retailer, or if it's about needing cheap energy to get stuff from all over the world, what are you going to say to other shareholders about how you're going to be making a profit in a few years' time? 
What are you going to say? Because if that's your model, that you depended upon falling prices, and you depended upon cheap energy, are you still going to be in business? Now, many of the firms we talk to are starting to say, well, maybe there's a different way of doing things then. Because if this brings a lot of risk and insecurity, what are we going to do? Okay, well, that's not the only sets of problems, and it's usual in this sort of talk to run through a lot, but I'm not going to run through a lot. You could add in population, you can add in uh, damage to the soil, water shortages, and so on. We, but we seem to be at an end point. We seem to have come to the end of our clockwork universe. Now, what do I mean by that? The great enlightenment, the great explosion of reason and rationality, uh, Descartes and so on, helped really establish the role of science and, and rationality. We divided things up, we analyzed, it, analyzed them, we, 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 we organized education for, for specialism and expertise, and we dived into the detail. But we stopped looking at the big picture. We'd seen how to control the world. We understand, we predicted, we controlled it. And it worked out really well for a lot of us, some of us. Some of us live like kings. But maybe this is not the end point. Maybe this is a worldview which is fading away. Why do I say that? Well, those reasons about commodities, about oil, about prices of commodities uh, and oil and, and so on, but it seems to me an end point in terms of thinking. What are the big ideas for the future? It always seems to be, now here's a, a characterization of a worldview. Now the, the top worldview is world as machine, what I've just been talking about. The idea that the world works a bit like a machine, we analyze it, it's predicts and control, we get on with it, much like uh, we could operate the levers of the economy, much like we could get progress by um, just churning more stuff through. But if that's coming to an end, what are our choices? Well, if we look at the top three choices, perhaps we could abandon the poor. Population is too large and growing. There aren't enough resources. If we can't do some remarkable things, maybe we just have to leave them to it. Now, that's an inhumane suggestion. But there are quite a lot of, there's quite a lot of evidence about, about changing food crops into fuel. We see that going on already, and do we really care that much? Some people would say, we've just got to wait till things settle down, because they're still assuming a linear, mechanical, throughput economy. If things are happening too much, well, those who are most fit to survive will survive. In other words, the rich will survive. What about doing with less? Couldn't we all just consume a bit less? That's one of the cozy options that people sort of get into. Couldn't we just consume a bit less? But there are so many more people with so many more aspirations. I'm not going to be able to stand up and say, no, you can't. Who would give me the political power to do that anyway? The rising nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, the Baltic states, parts of Europe, they want more things. They want better quality of life, more than things, perhaps. So maybe do with less is a pretty hard push, and would it work anyway? Is doing less harm the same as doing good? No, if, if my wife decides that every day she's only going to smack me around the face once instead of twice, yes, it's progress. But she shouldn't really do that. Couldn't we just say, as they did with slavery years ago, no, you don't cut down the number of slaves you've got. You ought to think of a better way of doing things than using slaves. So maybe do with less is a bit, you know, not very realistic when it comes down to it. And the one we operate at the moment is what I call green after gold, which is the idea that countries can move on from a rather crowded and busy and awkward set of lives to one that's a lot, lot better through economic growth, just keep pushing the growth button, and then it can be all tidied up. It can all get very clean again. So it's sort of a green after gold notion. But the trouble with that is, where is the growth coming from if before it came from lots and lots of spare resources, lots and lots of cheap energy, lots and lots of soil you could degrade by doing uh, very industrial farming methods which didn't return anything to the soil, where are you going to get that growth one? And what about the debt crisis? There isn't even the money, it seems, 
to throw at it to stimulate it. Stimulate what? When you've got these problems. So maybe green after gold isn't so good. What if we look at the world a rather different way? What if we thought that the world is much less like a machine, it's less linear, maybe it's more like a metabolism. Maybe it flows, it connects. Maybe even in science, we're beginning to see systems as non-linear, systems with feedback, systems which are complicated, where the input doesn't equal the output. It might be more, it might be less. You get runaway feedback. You get negative feedback. What if the world was really much more like that? What if it was more like as Hurricane Katrina on its way? What if it was more iterative, with lots of feedback and lots of flow and connection? It isn't chaotic. And the scientists have discovered that most real world systems are more like, as an extreme, Katrina than they are like a machine. And everything does connect. That hurricane didn't happen out of nowhere. It's a product of the whole meteorological scene. So if you had that, what can we say about the future? What about the bottom three? Revenge of Gaia. Maybe it's all too late anyway. Katrina was a hint. We can't really do anything. Lucky if we live in Estonia, because when climate change has really got going, everybody will want to come up live this way, or a bit further north, and you can do a great job housing lots and lots of other people from all over the place whose country has turned to dust. So that's the sort of, well, we can't do anything, sorry, but the world's in charge, we're not in charge, so forget it. What if we want to go back? What if we want to say, well, we could live in a more pre-industrial sort of way, it's, let's go back to one hectare and a few cows, a nice little village, work all day and night, to provide a few potatoes and get around with whatever's left of the technology. It's much more communal, and it's self-reliant, and arts and crafts will flourish. But it's all very good if you're into it. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's not what the modern world seems to want. Some people say, well, you've got no choice. But is there another way out? Now, that's what I've got a few minutes to talk about now. What about a circular economy? It assumes the world is a metabolism. And it assumes, moreover, that we can make it that way by design. It's a, an idea about intention, that there are essentially two types of material. the biological nutrients, things which are designed to be composted, to go through back to the soil, to be rebuilt again via biomass. And there are technical nutrients, things like chairs, and I thought these were real rocks for a start. but <laughs> Clearly not. Stuff here that you might want to not let the consumer have at all. Why do you want a washing machine? People look at you strangely and think, well, you know why. <laughs> well, do you want to own the washing machine? No, you want clean clothes. Do you want a refrigerator? No, you want cool food. Could you not, like the photocopier business, make most of your business deals as if it was a rental, a leasing? You pay for 30,000 washes. You pay for so much refrigeration services then the materials can be scavenged back in very good order. I won't call it scavenged, they could be returned with quality. What about that? How would that work? And instead of just recycling, mincing it up, bringing things back in at good quality to be remade and reused. And so it would be designed for disassembly. Things would be made to be made again. It's not a question then of trying to say to the consumer, you can't consume. It's a question of saying, how do we want to improve your quality of life? And what's the best arrangement for doing that? Yes, energy flows through. We don't uh, escape that law of thermodynamics. But we could design a system where these materials flow intelligently. Now, here's the principles of it. And it's uh, based on the work of people like Brown Garton McDonough, Janine Benyus, Amory Lovins. But there are not many rules to it, this circular economy. Waste is food, if it's biological. Everything should be good enough to go into the decomposing root. There are two types of stuff, biological and technical. If it's technical, firms will want to keep it. 
because it's valuable, because tomorrow it's worth more money than it was yesterday, why would you give it to the consumer? Shift to renewables, pretty much on the way anyway, struggles with that. But. And something that somebody else mentioned today, prices must, because if they're going to be arbiters, prices must tell the truth. What's the real cost of some of these things? And lastly, something we don't have any time for today, money should basically be a medium of exchange, not a pyramid scheme, <laughs> which it seems to have turned into at the moment. And some of the people that are involved with it, talking about this circular economy, an economy that might work long term, one that might be uh, not one full of regulation and control, but one which by design is recognizing the changing rules of the game for businesses and, monopoli not, and uh, building on it, not monopolizing it, but taking it and going with it. We think it's very exciting because for education, for education, this means a great deal of change too. If we have a schooling system that tends to be about standardization and conformity, about fitting in, schools were started as a way of building nations, the Prussians organized the first really modern schools. It wasn't about individuality and creativity, it was about removing that. It was about making sure people, if they didn't think the same way, at least behave the same way so they'd fit well into factories and farms. But this is a new world where we need, as a previous speaker was showing, creativity in abundance. We need to think of new ways of doing things. How do you make sure that you capture the cycle of materials how do you build refurbishment and repair and reuse systems that make sense on a tax basis, make sense for government, make sense for jobs? How is that done? And education at the moment is woefully inadequate to that task. It's still specialized, it's still focused, it's still conforming. We need more opportunity to allow that systems thinking, which is the key part of the circular economy, to come into schools. Really a lot of critical thinking, a lot of working in teams, working creatively, and exploring. This is a new world we're trying to build. If we build it on a circular economy basis, it will be full of, we hope, prosperity. It should bring jobs. It's a shift from capital and resources to labor. But it can't be done with a schooling system as we currently have it. Now, as an environmental educator, this is quite a shock because I spend a lot of my time doing the good things, encouraging individual behavior changes, uh, encouraging recycling. But a lot of these actually privatize responsibility. You're not going to fix a system so far out of joint with individual action alone. It's going to be the rules of the game that have to change. And that's making sure that systems like the legislative system, the tax system, work to encourage a shift to a circular economy, one where we can build prosperity in a new way. And since most of the system is waste, this might mean more growth as well. We know there's a lot of resources going through, but they're so wildly inefficiently and awkwardly used. There are great employment and business opportunities in trying to re rework those flows. So, Although I'm a little bit you know, concerned about the education systems at the moment because they're still stuck in the mechanical worldview that made the first part of our modern history so um, good, I am hopeful that they will, and they must really follow. If we're to survive in a circular economy, we'll have an education system that reflects that too. Okay, that's all for me for the moment. Thank you very much.